Perfect. Okay, guys. Time for the last session, right? Uh, Okay, sorry about this. The last session is um, about the uh, attacks of the industry. So all the interesting stuff that we have encountered or we're going to encounter, hopefully not, uh, or other companies encounter. I don't do it. Oh. Sorry. I mean, if I could do something about this, that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> Someone is hacking my mic. Okay. <laughs> okay, guys, so um, I guess it's better right now. Let's, let's move on. So if you were not on each of the sessions, just a super brief info. My name is Paula J, and uh, I perform the penetration tests. Uh, in a short words, I'm the uh, very technical person uh, also driving a company. Uh, of the other technical guys. And uh, basically, uh, we are uh, huge fans of security. That's what our company does, very much everything around it. So I would like to summarize that we are quite a boring group of people. Yes, because uh, a lot of us doesn't have any hobby besides actually uh, doing security high. What's that? Ah. Oh. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. <laughs> this is the last time. <laughs> He's going to do it. Thanks so much. It's working right now. OK. So uh, <laughs> let's move forward. Basically, what are the attacks that we're going to be talking about? First of all, uh, I got a little list. And all of these attacks are the ones that are quite important to address. And the reason why I picked those it's because um, they are the ones that usually make us in into the customer's infrastructure. We're going to start from the like a local point, which is a very convenient offline access, and then we're going to move to the very concrete scenarios where we will perform attacks uh, so that you can see where's the problem, and then with a little discussion how to fix it. I'm super open to all of the questions because the attacks are the ones that, as I mentioned, pretty much always work. Let's dig in, OK? Ready? Yes. yes or no? Come on. Ready? Yeah. Yes. Oh, this is what I like. Perfect, perfect. OK, so let's dig in. First of all, as we mentioned, offline access. So very simple case, right? So whenever we've got a machine with offline access, we are able to boot up from the installation media. This is a simple story. And repair your computer. Then we've got troubleshoot, advanced options, command prompt, as simple as it could be. I'm just going to skip this drive. That could save us if this was an hour drive that was encrypted. But uh, since it's an operating systems drive that is not encrypted, then basically we are able to take over. Very simple, very simple thing to do. A uh, little bit of a font enlargement, because I have kind of no impact on that at the very beginning. And what are we going to do? Well, rec edit, that's the first thing. And uh, from the local machine, uh, we will do file load hive. And then we're going to load the hive from our D drive, so the operating system drive. And then we will do Windows System32 and config. And this is the place where we're going to load software. And software is uh, to be named or whatever, yes? And then when we get into the local machine, we will get into mm, And then we're going to get into Microsoft and then Windows NT. As, as one of the keys. I will show you the key in a moment. Then we're going to go to current version, and then we are searching for something that is called image file execution options. Now, this is easy. This is quite easy. Because uh, when we have a look at that, uh, let me see where we've got it. Uh, so we should have this current version image file execution options. We got this. So long story short, uh, in this place, we are able to find operating systems different types of execution settings for the processes. So whenever we've got an executable, which is called in the debugging world an image, we're able to execute it with a bunch of options. And as simple as it could be, when we are over there, we, there are plenty of options, but we will need to create a new at that point, and it's going to be key. And that key we're going to name utilman.exe. Yes, like you see. And utilman.exe, it's nothing but 
and accessibility settings that are available on a Win logon screen. And because that's one of the few processes that are loaded, already started on a Win logon screen, that configuration we can affect, yes, we are able to get an access to an operating system pretty much immediately. At that certain stage, I will do here a new, well, within the, right now we are, of course, within the Utilman. Yes, so this is our, our key. And within the Utilman, we will do a new, and then string value, debugger, and inside we're going to do cmd.exe. Lovely. And with these settings, we're able to move forward. Yeah? So this is something that provides us an offline access on the top of the box. Now, why do I call it an attack of an industry? Because in a lot of companies, offline access is still not mitigated. When it's mitigated on laptops, it's not mitigated on regular PCs, which are still administered or used by users, and that is a little bit of a threat. Not to mention the conference computers, which could also bring the similar level of danger. So this is the situation we are talking about. Over here, of course, I've got the console, and this console is running as system. Yeah? So if I do net user, I get the list of my users, and I can do net user, I don't know what's the poll as password, but I will know for sure right now. So I'm resetting the password of the user. So simple thing, simple thing. So we are starting from this. And for now, I'm able to log on with the password that we got, and we are able to uh, move forward within the whole uh, stuff. So uh, this is something that always needs to be mitigated because this is the starting point for a lot of different types of attacks. One of the attacks that we've got on the top of that, of course, it's the attack which we could know, yes? And basically, this attack, it's called pass the hash. And this is the, this is the scenario. So pass the hash attack. Now, why does it uh, refer to offline access and is this really a direct path over here. Well, it could be. Depends on the situation. Today, within the conference, you've heard about LAPS. LAP is randomizing the local admin passwords, which is a great solution to prevent uh, pass the hash attack on the local level, not on the domain level, though. Yeah, so uh, this still needs to be mitigated by implementing uh, execution prevention, for example, or by implementing or end implementing credential guard on Windows 10. So this attack has been in the industry for the past 20 years, and it's a really big question mark why it wasn't fixed before. Well, that comes from the architecture design, architecture problem, but um, well, maybe maybe someone should have. Um, sit on it uh, a little bit earlier than, than right now. Anyway, pass the hash. So what's the point? The point is that, uh, well, regular user over here, can I, for example, um, well, access the resources within the, within the domain over here? Well, I cannot, but what I want to show you it's one, one thing that uh, basically, um, whenever we would like to get access into, into the server, then with the local user, we cannot do much. So what I will do, first of all, in order to perform the pasty hash, we need to have the console running as an administrator. Yes, we know that. The reason why it's like this is because we need to, on the top of that a debug privilege. And that debug privilege is only grabbable if you're a member of the local administrators group. By the way, this is one of the hardening steps that should be done, which is removing a debug privilege from anybody instead of a selected user which could be a local administrator or someone, someone um, else or, it, or none, because effectively you don't need that privilege. Anyway, let me get in. So the first thing we're going to do, uh, well, I will, I will go to tools. And uh, basically, uh, let's get into um, the key. Well, I got, uh, sorry, over here, uh, this one, Kiwi Secure Edition. Very good. And uh, I got here a custom version of the Mimikatz. I can run, for example, uh, this one, why not? And that version of the Mimikatz will allow me to uh, perform the pasty hash attack. But in order to do that, I still need to have a hash. So in order to get the hash, well, as simple as this, I will need to uh, get it. And in order to get it, uh, as we remember from my past session, in order to get access to some, I need to be a local system over here. Yeah, so basically, we're going to go to tools, and then ps exec, ps exec, here we go, s minus s minus i minus d cmd.exe. Perfect. We're going to be local system in the moment, and that's the moment where from tools I'm happy to execute 
again, our CQ hash dump version 2, sum, dump, enter, and this is a place where we've got our hashes, yes? So this, at the very end, this is something that we call NT hash. Some people call it NTLM hash. That's not too bad. Uh, both names are good. Um, this is MD4 of the user's password, yes? Sometimes we hear MD5. It's not MD5, it's MD4. Uh, you just calculate it, you're going to see. So as simple as, as this. Uh, and this is something that we're going to use as a hash over here, because this is the hash of the local administrator. And the question is, will we be able to get access with this data uh, to the local administrator's machine. So let's dig in. Basically, um, here in this console, I would like to show you one more thing. If I do PS exec into 10, 10, 10, 200 cmd.exe, which is my remote server out there, question is what I'm going to get because I'm doing this with the local account. The answer is quite surprising over here because uh, the answer that we should get, it's just going to take a moment, here we go, the username or password is incorrect. Which username or password? Because I didn't specify anything. And uh, basically, the username and password we are talking about is the one that is stored in the memory by the local security authority subsystem. And uh, that's basically your username and password. And this is due to the single sign-on feature that is available in Windows anyway. Yes. So basically, here, I am not able to log on. Let's dig in here. The first thing I will do, it's a privilege debug. Because this is the privilege. Um, sorry, it's a difficult word. <laughs> Here we go, privilege debug. That's the one that I'm able only to get if I'm by default member of the local administrators group. Imagine not be, being able to get it. Then my attack will just fail because I'm not able to interact with local security authority subsystem uh, without a debug privilege. If I would, you will have the same effect as you had, let me think, 15 years ago when there was a Windows XP without the service pack when you get Blaster. Uh, there was this 30 seconds and shut down thing, yes? So this is what happens when you poke with an operating system mechanism without having a debug privilege. They're like, ooh, th this is something that we don't like to see shut down in 30 seconds, yes? Okay, anyway, secure LSA, PTH, in order to perform the pass the hash, user, administrator, that's the one that we need, then domain. Well, this is a challenge because we don't have a domain here. It's a local account. So local host, because we're going to leverage single sign-on as well later. Yes. So I will authenticate locally as an admin administrator, and uh, this will allow me to move forward. OK. And the next one, NTLM, where we specify our NT hash. And I got it in a clipboard, paste. It's all full, which everything is good. So by default, I'm opening cmd.exe. Yeah. Now, tricky part of that, that is that if I do this, it's not true. It's that CMD is reading this information from my profile. I'm not Paula here. I'm an administrator here. But a CMD, it's kind of dumped here. So the next stage that we will need to do is to get access into uh, the stuff that I'm talking about, which is the 10, 10, 10, 200, to leverage single sign-on. So let's verify the difference. Let's see what kind of difference we've got. So PS exec, 10, 10, 10, 200 cmd.exe, bank, and host name, and we are right now on the other server. Who am I? And I'm no longer Paula, but I'm the serv lo local administrator of that server, yes? So very simple scenario. What's the chance that this attack will happen? 98% when there is a chance for it, it will happen, because this is the most popular unfortunately working attack of the industry that wasn't mitigated and it's very often not mitigated at the customer side. Okay? So this is something that we should uh, pay attention uh, to. Good. Okay, so the next stuff. Next stuff is something that I was dying to show you. Yes? So I put it on the attack of an industry because there is no patching for it. You wonder or not, there is no patch. That's a kind of a sad story here. And basically, uh, what is the situation is that basically, um, whenever, whenever we are dealing with the Kerberos pre-authentication, and this is what I was, um, what, what failed as one of my demos, uh, now I would like to show you how it basically works, yes? So um, what was the fix? If you are wondering, it was just that rest I had to restart the machine. It's kind of hate to say I'm really the last person that will reboot the computer when something is happening, but uh, sometimes it's the quickest way uh, to move forward, yes? 
Okay, guys. So we are we are good to go. Now let's see uh, what kind of stuff do we have. First of all, uh, what I did in the meantime, in the meantime when I was talking, uh, this is the same machine that you saw. Uh, I am logged on over here as Paula, and what I will do, I will try to get access to the domain resources. Yes. So at that stage, what I will do, uh, backslash backslash ws 2012 secure.tech. Yes, I want to get access to it, and I've got a question about providing username and password. Well, I don't have it because this is my or user's local workstation. It has nothing to do with the domain and so on. Yes. So, question is can we log on to the domain from the workstation of that kind? Sure. So, in order to do that, just a, a little bit of a repeat maybe, but it would be great if you could feel the whole uh, situation. I am right now logging on to the Windows 10 by using a security device, which is a virtual smart card. Yes, I'm, using, I'm logging on with this one. That's fine. So this was the place that we were, we were in within the keynote. And what I will do right now, I will pre-generate the Kerberos request for myself um, so that I'm able to get them and submit them in order to get the ticket. Um, also, of course, we know that within the Kerberos, we've got by default this five minutes uh, resting time. So I will need to perform this uh, quite fast, but that's fine. We, we've got time. And I'm starting with the offset one, which means I've got a one minute to move on, and then we are able to move forward with the attack. Yes. So let's get these tickets. Here we go. So the, the, these are the requests. And what will be my job right now is to copy them to the client. So user can put them on the pen drive, uh, user can uh, send them by email, whatever. And what I will do on my side, I will actually get them, and I will put them, uh, I will just copy them like this, yes? So these is, I'm connected over here to one machine and to another machine. We're going to do it for the purpose, for the sake of the presentation. I'm just going to take these buddies, and I'm going to move them over here. Yes, so this is good. So they are already on the user's personal machine. Lovely, lovely. So when they are on the user's personal machine, what's the most beautiful part over here, that for none of these demos, you need to be an administrator. None of them. Basically, uh, you, can be, you can be whatever, whoever you want over here. We could do it both from Windows 8, 8.1, Windows 10, it doesn't really matter. So at that certain stage, uh, what I would do? Well. Let's get into um, uh, Mimi Guts, yes. And uh, in this case, this is this one. This is the place where we've got all the all the tickets. Start dot, yes. Uh, I will take the name of this ticket. Uh, the one that is up there will be the freshest one. So I'm gonna grab this and uh, the name, and then I will submit it over here, yes. So here, I need to use the tool which is called um, ASK TGT. Yes, and then AS rec, and then I will specify the name of that particular ticket, paste, dot, musti, very good. And then another one, PTT, let's verify what's the scenario. What is important for now is that what's the current time and what's the authenticator time. Yes, so we will need to, we will need to uh, verify if everything is good. And right now it is. We are not late and we are not too early too. So question for us is, will we be able to get access to the uh, domain resources? And uh, let me verify, and I am. Bam. Yay. I'm happy that it worked out. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, this is a local user, yes? And uh, what's the story behind it? The story behind it is that uh, whenever the user is logging on with a smart card, um, user can pre-generate the authentication requests, yes? And these requests, there is no need by the protocol itself to verify if you have a private key at the moment you actually submit them for authentication. I'm happy to generate myself this request for future for the next year. Yes, I can do that, because I can. And they're going to be valid, like, they're going to expire every one hour or every day. It depends on my settings, yes? But a user can do it normally. So why a user cannot do it in, for the future? That's the problem that I'm talking about. Patching, none. Solution, well, you need to prevent to execute the tool. Because to prevent this, you cannot really. Yeah, so this is a little bit of a case. OK, you are not able to prevent it by using that combination of? No. 
that's the problem. Because see, it's about Ker Kerberos pre-out re request generation. Yeah? So that's, that's the problem. Yes? What could happen is that if you take a smart card from the user, you could lock the user. That would, of course, help out over here, because user will not be able to get the valid ticket. Of course, he's got a request, but who cares if the, ticket, if the, if the user is disabled? So user is kind of not getting it. That's the, that's the story. Uh, Microsoft is right now writing a draft that will be amendment for the RFC, where it's clearly written that the Kerberos within the protocol, there is no requirement to possess the private key upon the request of a ticket, yes, in that scenario. Microsoft is writing a draft right now, but right now, it, we are, we're at the stage of writing raft, guys. So when that's going to be an implementation for that? When there's going to be a fix? We, uh, I guess, way beyond in time. Yeah? OK, good. So this is something that I wanted to show you. I'm glad it, it worked out. Now, a second thing uh, from the attack perspective is that uh, where, where's the threat? The threat is that uh, there's a lot of people that are able to authenticate as someone. I can be someone, and when I get the ticket, I'm able also to get access to the user's secret because it was generated originally by the user. So whenever we are thinking about all the privacy here, this is all violated because if the user, for example, let's say doesn't lock the desktop, I come over with my tool. Uh, of course, let's close the subject of being recognized by antivirus because our tools are not. Yes, because we've, we, com we can compile them today. Who's going to know about them? Yes, and we have actually written our reflective P loader so that we are, you're not even able to see uh, if we are using the tool that we don't have an access to the source code, we are rebuilding it, and uh, it works absolutely well. What is preventing here, it's a code execution prevention. So potentially user not blocking the desktop, we're able to come over, uh, get the requests, so the musty files that I was showing, and then you just grab them and you put them in your own laptop that is not connected to the main bank, you get an access to the domain resources. That's what it means. So that's why people need to log the desktop or we need to implement and or end, we need to implement code execution prevention solution, which is a new black right now. Anyway, let's move forward. A another attack that I would like to talk about is related with uh, code execution prevention and what kind of stuff do we actually block in a company. Uh, the reason why I'm touching this subject is because it is uh, kind of cool to see that PowerShell-based attacks are the ones that are doing fantastic. Yes? We've got a lot of hacking tools that are written only within the PowerShell. And even though you execute, uh, implement the code execution prevention solution, who cares if PowerShell is the one that is allowed? We could be like, hmm, but maybe we should, um, for example, implement the code execution policy or the script execution policy for the PowerShell. Well, forget about this. This solution was never introduced to maintain security. It was introduced for you to not to make mistakes. That's it. But from the execution perspective, it's not helping at any point. So first, let me show you the problem, and then let's discuss the solution, OK? So PowerShell-based attacks. It's going to be actually something short that I will show you, but I think um, might be significant, might be significant. So uh, let me get into my machine. That's going to be Windows 10. Let's do it on Windows 10. Nice, 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 nice. OK. So what do I have uh, over here? Well, first of all, I got a little bit of a script. This script I call Elevate CMD. The reason why, it's because uh, here we are just a regular user, and we will elevate to a, quite a privileged account by just running this script. OK? So how does it work? I will explain you in a second. Let's see the result and effect uh, first. OK, guys, so first of all, uh, view, full screen, lovely. And then, uh, well, what could I see? Well, let's say I want to, um, let, me, let me check over here who we are. So I would like to start the console as an administrator, just to prove to you, yes, I cannot because I'm not an administrator. I'm a regular user over here. OK, so can I execute the PowerShell script? Yes? Well, yeah, I cannot because uh, script, uh, running script is disabled in the system. Of course, what you, I guess, expect that I'm going to do, I'm going to select the, this, and I'm going to do run selection. Yes and no. Uh, we could do it, uh, but 
I want to show you uh, something else. What we're going to do, we're going to start the command prompt as a regular user. I'm going to go to the place where my script is. So elevate a CMD PS1. Yes, yeah, so oh, I need to be in PowerShell first. Sorry about this. So PowerShell, lovely. Yes, and then elevate is this one. Of course, we've, we've got the same story. Uh, but who really cares about this? If I can do this, type, and then I will specify uh, the script. So elevate CMD. I'm just going to, oops, I'm just going to maybe do this or even like name it like that. And then I'm going to do pipe, PowerShell, no profile. So what happens? Script executes, yes? There are over 15 types of ways how to bypass an execution policy within the PowerShell, yes? Everybody can do it. Within the attack, it's so easy. Absolutely, it's not convenient to run selections, because if you've got a remote shell, how you are supposed to run the selection? You cannot, yes? And I cannot run the script at the same time. So what do I do? We figure out, yes? If you do get content, it's going to be the same effect, yes, instead of type. Uh, type is a kind of old school thing. But anyway, so we've got this. Now you are probably wondering who we are in this script. And if we find out, we are our anti system. So how could it be? Wait, wait. We were a user without the possibility to run the console as a local administrator, and now we are a local system? Like, what? Yeah, well, that's kind of not cool, as we can imagine. And uh, this is due to the vulnerability that was not really a long time ago in Windows, which was, if you want to search for more, it has a code MS1632, which allowed us, within the PowerShell, to move from the regular user, user not being an admin, to the local system in a second, and then you can execute, obviously, what you want as a next stage within the, within the attack. Now, everything is done in a PowerShell. Yes? Can our user run a PowerShell? Because if answer is yes, that is such a massive problem for everybody. Yes? Not to mention, by the way, a new trend that is coming, um, which is ransomware in a PowerShell. Yes? So who's going to prevent this? Yes, everybody has access to da its own data. I can run PowerShell too. Uh, I can bypass the execution policy too. It's perfect. Perfect. Nothing but to earn money on ransomware by having it written in the PowerShell. OK. So this is something that we should be addressing. When you are implementing your code execution uh, prevention uh, solution, don't forget about that. Very often forgotten stuff that is misconfigured. For example, even though you implement AppLocker, this is something that we see that is very, very, very often missing. OK, guys, the next attack of an industry, which is one of my favorites, which is called SMB Relay. Or maybe we should call it SMB Relay X, which is the next era of an SMB Relay. So here comes the story. A couple of years ago, there was a vulnerability. That vulnerability was related to the NTLM authentication where you are making a request for the NTLM authentication, and eventually, as a response, you are providing a challenge in order to authenticate to the server. Uh, then this challenge, which is your granting kind of a ticket to authenticate to the server, was forwarded to yourself. And then hacker could uh, get access to yourself. Yes? So it was like a simple loop. Now, how does the authentication work so that I can give you a little bit of a background what we're going to be doing? We're going to be doing the stuff like this. Basically, when we've got a client and the client wants to authenticate to the server, there are two ways we can do it. One, it's an NTLM authentication. Another one, it's Kerberos. How do we know which one we are using? Can we downgrade a type of an authentication? Of course, that's the problem. Yes, and again, we have only a couple, couple of customers out of hundreds that decided to disable NTLM authentication within the network, which is a huge challenge. But they had to because they are quite, they wanted to be really secure and they have a need for that. Yes, NTLM protocol, it's not that bad. It's just that it's implemented in an absolutely wrong way where we are able to listen to what is happening within the network and then take the challenge that someone was trying to send and pass it to the place where we want to authenticate. Putting this in the normal words, it works like this. I want to authenticate 
hey, this is this data. Please encrypt it with your hash. And I'm like, OK, let's do it. So this is the data encrypted with my hash. That's this challenge that I'm sending. And then the server says, absolutely, access is granted. Yes, Because how the server can verify? Well, he knows the challenge. He knows my hash. He's capable to verify and encrypt it in the same way. This value equals this value. Perfect. We're getting in. As simple as this. Yes. So when we've got an attacker in the middle, Yes, what happens is that everything happens, as I said, besides the end. The end is like, hey, you are able to authenticate. So hacker says, you are not able to authenticate, and I'm authenticating. Yes, so we are men in the middle over here. Now, let me explain the attack itself. Attack consists of the three stages. Stage number one, which is actually quite straightforward. Let's do it. And for that, we're gonna, we can use plenty of tools, really. But we're going to use the uh, Kali. Why not? Yes, Kali is uh, accessible by everybody. Everybody can do it. So uh, why not? Uh, we could use MSF payload. We could use MSF Venom. Really, which, which one do you prefer? So the stage number one is to actually create a payload, is to generate a payload. What is the payload? Payload is a piece of code that's going to be executed on the computer upon the attack. Yes. So when everything's going to happen, when we're going to authenticate, that's the piece of code that we're going to run. And that piece of code is leveraging here reverse TCP. Reverse TCP, it's a console that allows us reversibly connect back to us. Hacker, in this case, it's 10, 10, 10, 99. Yes. So this is the, this is the setup. OK, so I think we can, we can uh, do the stage number one. Uh, so we got this. Let's generate this payload. Uh, that's gonna be that's gonna be the setup. As I said, it's already deprecated. You can use both. I like both. It doesn't really matter for that scenario. It's the simplest payload we could have. Lovely. So when we got this, now it's time to move on here. Where we are in right now, this is of course Metasploit framework, and within the Metasploit framework, we will just set up a simple attack, a simple simple listener or handler, yes, as we should say maybe. So in this scenario, what is the case is that we have here um, use exploit multi handler, yes. So this is the this is the uh, case, and we are able here to uh, specify, just to show you, uh, that we're going to be listening on the certain IP addresses on the certain port. Yes. So as simple as this, let's dig in and let's do it. So we've got use exploit multi handler. And then I'm going to set up the payload so that upon listening and connection, we're going to execute the payload that we have created. So we will do set payload, set payload, come on, OK. Oh, it's kind of slow. Um, and then we're going to specify it's going to be Windows. Yes. And then it's going to be meter reader. Should be good. And then reverse TCP. TCP. Lovely. So we got it. This is our payload set right now. Show options to verify everything is OK. Uh, let me set one more thing, which is uh, set L host. So this is the specification or where we or our victim will be connecting to. So in my case, it's 10, 10, 10, 99. And uh, the only thing we can do right now is to start to listen, which is exploit. I'm not, expo I'm not running any like, exploit over here or something. I'm just listening. Yes, that's it. But the true power comes in, in here. What we're going to be doing right now over here, we will be performing a relay. Relay of what? Of this, encrypt, of this encrypted challenge with our hash. That's what we rely. So when we've got this, um, well, I don't know if it's going to be happening. I'm going to sniff the network, of course. But uh, I need to set up the appropriate sniffer, appropriate listener to sniff for those. Because I don't care about the other stuff. I only care, care about the situations where people authenticate in between the servers. Now, I have to, to be fair, uh, say one thing. Where do we use and when do we use NTLM? Yes. When, for example, you connect to backslash backslash IP address, sometimes when you connect by the short names, yes. For example, service accounts. Very often, you can when you listen, you can see that service accounts when they have no SPN, so service principal name for Kerberos authentication configured, they use NTLM. Now tell me, but you don't need to uh, answer. Um, how often do we actually configure SPNs for the service accounts? We don't. That's the point. 
Th that's actually a big problem. That's why this attack at the customer infrastructure works perfectly in the morning. When everybody comes in, everybody wants to connect somewhere and so on, whoa, our environment, you will see, it's going to be super calm. In a real environment, you've got like, bang, you don't have to even really ask for anything. It just comes to you, yes? Now, this attack always works. Why? Because the code that we're going to execute is A, not recognized by antivirus because we have compiled it, yes? B, if there is no code execution prevention. But who implements SMB signing? Especially taking into consideration that Microsoft says that it impacts in the documentation on 15% of a network performance. Wow. It's not that bad, actually, but comparable, actually. Uh, so these are the mitigations, which mitigation techniques that we've got over here. Anyway, let's start the attack. Python, of course. Uh, we're going to use for that SMB relay X, PY, very good. And then we're going to specify our victim, which is minus H, 10, 10, 10. Uh, who will be our victim today? This guy, let's say. And we will execute minus E, punk, punk, uh, pale.exe for the payload. Yes, so we've got that. Now, we are ready to go. Before I press enter, I want to show you the background of the attack. It's going to be absolutely quick, quick explanation. What's the story? The story is that we're going to be attacking this guy, yes, this, this victim. Now, what is important for us is to move, and I'm going to see it remotely, so don't, don't worry, but I'm going to move over here into the process that runs as a system. And uh, I will be able to list the process ID remotely, but we can kind of now uh, acknowledge some of them. Actually, we picked the worst probe, because the one that I don't want to connect, it's called client server runtime of system, because otherwise I'm going to have a blue screen, which will be a no-no here. I want something cooler. I want the, the, the guy that is SVC host. Now, SVC host is the trashiest job you could ever have, have in an operating system. If, if we applied for a job in operating system, I would like to be local security authority of system, obviously, but whoever is SVC host, it's not a good uh, job. Uh, 980, it's the one, okay? So we're going to be using this one. Uh, let's take this. Okay, we are ready to execute. Uh, so at that certain stage, we will uh, over here, so this one is already listening. Now we're going to do the uh, relay. So what I'm going to do right now, I will go to the other server, absolutely not related, and I'm going to browse into the file server, which is also not related with this demonstration. And uh, what will be the scenario is that this, um, I'm browsing by 10, 10, 10, uh, uh, I'm browsing by IP address, uh, obviously, so NTLM version 2 comes to place. So this is the situation that I've got. So what I have to do when I'm already here, I have to go here, and uh, right now I've got the session open. I can do PS to list the processes that are uh, engaged. Uh, let's see. Sessions, ah, I have to be fast. Sessions uh, minus interact with 1. Uh, sessions minus i1. What? I, oh, I made a typo. Oh, no. Oh, come on. Oh. That's not a problem. See? We got it back. Yes? OK. Session uh, minus i interact with number two in this case. Ah, oh, sessions. Jesus Christ, this is like... What is this? <laughs> what? Aha! Uh -huh. Okay, let's see. No, this is better. Sorry, this is good. Migrate 980. I wasn't. Oh, no. Uh, sorry, it's like that, unfortunately. But that's fine. Uh, I got uh, dumped a little bit. Here we go. We, we will make it eventually. Yes, three times. Session one opened. Great, give me the metapreter. Ah, lovely. OK, we are already in the sessions. Very good. So um, migrate, 980 it was, right? So I'm migrating right now into that particular process. And of course, question is, will I be able to do that? Yes. So this is one of the, one of the uh, processes that we've got uh, running over here. Um, sometimes it's possible. Sometimes we have to wait. Sometimes it's a little bit longer. Uh, as you see, yeah. So it just takes a little bit of time. That's the that's the point. We're gonna do this. 
one more time, one more time, because I want to show you the result, because it's, the result is worth it. The result is absolutely worth it. So we do this one more time. Sending stage, OK. Maybe it's not a good process that we picked. Who knows? Uh, we've got for that time about 15 seconds. So this is a very short time. And if we don't manage within the time, we will not be able to move forward. Yay, very good. OK, shell. And then uh, host name. We are right now on our victim, which is Windows 8 client. But this is the best. Of course, who we are is this. Now, it's local system. Now, how, how? Is this a matter of vulnerability? No, that's the point. It works in almost every infrastructure. Why? Because some privileged guy over here was crazy enough to connect by using NTLM authentication or by just simply speaking, querying an IP address. Now, could we avoid that? Sure. You need to configure on the top of NTLM either SPN verification, either, SP, either SMB signing, which isn't a very good idea, or code execution prevention, or get rid of NT, NTLM in total. Yeah, this is the mitigation that we got right now. It's such an unaddressed problem that we are dealing with right now. We could be like, yeah, but we are not using short names. It doesn't matter. Everybody that opens a browser ask for, asks for WPAD, which is the proxy record. And if I run another attack simultaneous to this, which is called responder within the NetBIOS, yes, I'm able to send you everybody responses for every single short name you are asking for. That will cause you to authenticate or try to authenticate to me by using NTLM. The attack is exactly the same. Yes, NetBIOS, it's a, a revenge of a devil on earth. Yes, if we could describe it somehow. Um, of course, when we are thinking about this attack, you, you don't have to do that in your infrastructure, but what you can do, uh, I will just zoom in a little bit, you can, for example, try to run Responder. Responder is quite nice because it allows us Responder minus I 10, 10, 10, 99 to enforce these authentication types. And this is minus small d minus small r, an enforcement to authenticate and respond on every short name ever queried in this network. So, uh, excuse me, if I run this, um, what's the case? No, it should be fine. Uh, or actually, maybe I should uh, clear. Let me check. Responder minus i 10 to 10 99 minus d minus r. Could be. Yeah, sometimes it fails. It's uh, really, uh, I will need to reboot my server because it's not a very stable solution. But in most cases, it should be fine, yes? OK, so this is my responder. Does it really? Uh, no, this is good. This is 100%. I do have a permission. So and OK, let me check. Let me check. And uh, we will do uh, intranet, for example, yes? Oh, good. So it works, yes? As I said, stability, it's not very good sometimes. But uh, basically, we can see that I requested on one of the machines intranet. And this guy, bang, already responded. Yes. So what I'm going to do, he's going to be like, yeah, yeah, I'm your intranet. Please authenticate using NTLM. So you are like, oh, yeah, sure, let's do it. Yes. So basically, someone gets your challenge, and that challenge can be forwarded somewhere else. Yes. So this is the situation we are dealing with right now. Kind of a pain in the back. Yes. Good. So we've got, we've got that. Um, and this one is running happily. Yes. And uh, basically, this kind of like this mess that you see on the way, these are my different probes for authentication. And if we get closer and we analyze what was actually happening over here, you can see that there was an authentication uh, from 10, 10, 10 to 100, so the server not related. And we are attacking our victim, victim by relaying to a victim a challenge. Yeah, so this is the setup. We call this attack an NTLM. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, we call it an SMB relay. It's relying on NTLM uh, authentication. Yes. OK, some questions in the meantime? Not for now. OK, so we can, we can move forward. Good. So um, one of the other attacks that we call an attacks of an industry, it's uh, Data Protection API uh, Classic, the backup key existence. Now, it sounds like a rocket science, maybe, because uh, it's like, what is this backup key that we are talking about? It's a horribly difficult subject, but very cool. Let me start over. We are talking over here 
about um, in this in this case cache logons or cache credentials and their affection on different types of sec secrets that the user possesses. And in this demonstration, I would like to show you two things. Two things. One, he was asking question about uh, cache logons in the previous demonstration, so we're going to cover them now. So you will see that cache logons is, are there, it's fine. Forget about removing them. It's they are fine. Yes. Uh, we're going to get there in a second. Second thing is the data protection API relies on the key that is in a domain controller's memory that when someone gets this, this person is able to decrypt everybody's secrets. And that's my point to show you. Quite serious stuff. Let's dig in. What we're going to do in this scenario, uh, I'm going to uh, just shut down Linux because I don't need it to be disturbing me. And uh, I will use for that, yeah, why not, a Windows 10. Actually, it doesn't really matter which machine because it's going to work on all of them, yeah? But OK, so we've got our Windows 10. In Windows 10, ah, good, good. I've got um, this. This is Nearsoft. We have super, super easy uh, tools. Well, very nice tools as, as well. Uh, they are displaying you your own passwords that you stored in a browser. That's kind of normal, yes, because within the Data Protection API, it's kind of obvious that you have access to those passwords. If you open the browser, you can use them. It means this guy can also use them, yes? So this is, this is uh, obvious, but I want to show you one thing, that I see the password, yeah? Let's acknowledge this. I see it. I got access to it. What is even more, if I, over here, take Freddy, Punk, and I'm going to lock his account. What is important for me to show you is this. So the password that I'm using on for logon. Yeah, so this is the password password. Hopefully you see that. And it's not anything else. It's this. And I'm logging on to the domain yes, in order to be able to browse a domain resources if I want to. If I want to do secure.tech, I'm an authenticated user within the domain. Yes, so everything is fine. Now, question is, what about cache logon? Well, cache logon is kind of cool because cache logon um, relies on the mechanism or the function that we call a PBK DF2, and this is basically a, a result of another function. There is a function that is called DCC1, which was used, by the way, in Windows XP to protect cache credentials, and then it had a meaning to work on them. Now it's not. So basically, what was used as a matter of fact in a Windows XP as a cache credentials was DCC1. And DCC1, it's a MD4 on the username and the user's password's hash. And on the top of that, we've got MD4. Yes, so that was a cache credentials uh, data. Right now, what we've got is that MSDCC, or, or in this case, MSDCC1, it's a part, only a part, of a most advanced function, which only leverages this little data that comes out of that function in a little bit bigger picture. So let me dig in into the whole scenario to show you how cache logons affect or not users' data. OK? That's going to be kind of uh, interesting. So let's dig in. Let's take this. Let's do power. And let's do restart. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to restart uh, into the ISO image. The, reason, the only reason why I will do it offline is just to clear the picture uh, so that we've got the 100% image of what's happening. That's not a cool picture. I'm not sure if I actually, uh, is this, am I, what the hell was this? No, I want offline, come on. OK, one more time, one more time. Yes, yeah, so we will do restart. Sure, just give me what I want. OK, um, so we're going to reboot. OK, now it's, now it's beautiful. Good. So, um, and at the same time, I will simulate at that stage being out of network, OK? Because cache logon data, it is happening where we do have no access to the network. So this network is just not connected, OK? So we've got a clear cache credentials. Credentials, by the way, it's not a good word because these are not credentials, but let's move forward. Next, repair your computer. We will definitely repair it a little bit. So troubleshoot, advanced options, common prompt. And uh, again, let me enlarge the font because uh, I have no effect on this. And it would be great if everybody could see 
here we go, the, the stuff. I'm going to go to D. I'm going to also go to, um, in this case, uh, tools. And I will, go into, I will go into Kiwi Secure Edition. Uh, sorry, CQ Tools. Yep, no, no. Tick, tick, tick. And CQ Tools, very good. Kiwi Secure Edition, lovely. And uh, we're going to go to this folder. And I'm going to run Mimikat. And again, Secure Edition. This is a unique edition always that is not recognized by antivirus. If it one day is going to be, we've got thousands of other copies, yes? which we are happy to share, by the way, uh, for the good, obviously. So uh, what we're going to do over here, we're going to do LSA dump cache. And we are overriding because we cannot get access to them. Because don't, let's don't forget, DCC1 being one of the values within the function is actually a, a hash. Yeah, so it's a hashing function. So long story short, we want it or not, what is happening out there is that um, we are not able to decrypt anything. We, the only thing we are able to do is to pre-generate it. Just to make a long story short, the cache logon data yes, looks like this. So the one on the left, it's a value in the registry. In the security hive, there is a cache, and there is this value. Yes? Now, the one that you see on the right side, it's an analyzed cache logon. That function that I was talking about, it's the one that we can spot in blue. Yes, so this MSDCC2, PBKTF2, where DCC is only a part of it. And then we run it in 10,240 rounds. Now, the reason why I'm saying this within the 16 blocks is that it's a pretty complex value. Can we brute force it? Of course you can, but it requires a, like a multi-dimensional rainbow table where you first need to get appropriate username and to the, on the top of this, appropriate password. Whoa. So it's getting much, much more complex, yes? So um, this is something that is uh, worth to have a look at. And effectively, when we are having an offline access here, we're going to do LSA dump cache. And then we're going to overwrite it by using here Windows. I, I cannot tab it, so I have to type it. System32 config system hive and D Windows system32 config security. Yes, because this is a place where the cache logon data is. And system we need for what? And before you answer me a question, I got a t-shirt for you, OK? So who tells me what the system key is for? It's with the pasty hash raccoon, yes? Don't go in this to an Arab countries. Yeah, good point. Boot key. That's what you meant. I, yeah, I see it. OK. So uh, a security key, there's a security key in the registry. Absolutely, in system. That's the one that we need to use to encrypt the data we're going to be uh, saving there, yes? That data is encrypted with AS, by the way. Uh, may I put it here? Yeah, uh, don't worry, don't worry about it. You're just going to pick it when we finish, yeah? So it's yours. Yeah, good, good point. Uh, he listened the last session. Very good. Uh, I'm sure you know it all. You're just shy. OK, let's move forward. So we've got this, <laughs> and then Kiwi. Uh, so we've got uh, an update of the credentials. We can spot over here that uh, what is uh, important is this Freddy's data. So Freddy Krueger's secrets are the ones that are interesting for us. Yes, yeah, so his cache logon data has been overwritten with our logon data that we know. So her password changed. Yes. So question is, to what and are we able to get access to secrets? Let's find out. So now, after that little change, I'm not booting from the CD DVD anymore. Uh, I will be trying to log on with the password that we know from the cache logon data. And uh, you will see what's going to be the result. It's actually quite interesting. So right now, this computer doesn't have an access to the network. I'm typing password, password that we were using before, as you see, enter. Nope, it's not this one. Let's don't forget about one little factor here. It's not a local account we are working on. It's a domain account. It's a little bit different story. And Mimi Katz is going to be the password that I will be using over here. As you see, a new one, enter, 
and effectively we are logging on by overriding cache data. Now, what's the danger? The danger is that everybody can override cache data. That's my point. Yeah? So should we have zero or 50, which is, or 10, which is default? So what should be our setting for the cache, cache credentials? Seriously, you choose. Because within the current times, it's not a dangerous mechanism. We could be like, how come? We logged on. Of course, but that's not cache credentials that are dangerous. What is dangerous is an offline access or possibility override security hive. In, in a technical frame, possibility override security hive is dangerous. So f define it, what would be the path for you so that someone can do that. So you can have anything really set on cache credentials. I would, because it's always security comfort thing, I would put on comfort. Yes, use security, we use cache log on data, because in, when the time's gonna come when someone will be able to brute force it, meh. No, it's going to take some time. Seriously, it's a very complex value there. Now, wow, it will be interesting for us to find out if effectively we are able to pull out that data we were talking about, yes? So this is, this is the setup. We can get into our place. Um, and the question is, of course, what about, um, well, what about uh, the password, yes? So CQ tools, and over here we've got our Chrome pass. And that's an interesting situation. That takes some time, as you see, uh, because uh, I'm waiting for master keys that encrypt my secrets to be decrypted with my password. But this is not happening, because my password is not capable of decrypting this. As you see, password is not there. Now, you probably will not be sitting here if everything was OK, right? So this is good or bad? It's good, yes? That's exactly how Data Protection API protects us. So let me tell you something. And this is what we have found out as a team. And I'm always very proud to, to say it. Basically, in the domain controller's memory, there is a little cool key floating. And that little cool key floating uh, it is uh, very cool because, let's start it and let's run it, uh, let's run it, because this is the one that protects us a second copy of the master key that we always have in our profile. Yes? Um, where is it? It is actually when we get into the user's profile and we're going to go to percent app data percent. We go, uh, this is roaming, of course. We go to Microsoft. We go to protect. We go to the user's SID, and this is the place where we've got our master keys. Normally, you're going to have a little bit less. I got a lot because I play with this. But uh, basically, everybody that is a member of the domain has this little guy in the profile. What is this? This is what we call a backup key. And that backup key, it's the public key of the domain. So where's the private key? That's my question. Private key, it's in domain controller's memory. Oh, Uber, cool. So if I have access to the domain controller's data, to the backup of it, or to the real system, yes, or offline, or whatever, yes, then I'm able to grab that key. And if this is the public key that encrypts this data here, I have a private key. I'm able to also decrypt this data here. That kind of is a little bit stinky. So let's get into the situation where we, on the domain controller, will be extracting this key. And yeah, that's my goal right now. So in order to extract this key, I will need to use for that Mimikatz, for example. And I will specify over here, for example, LSA dump, and then backup keys, and then export, lovely. So what we have exported right now, let me show you, is the Lille PFX over here. I'm, I'm uh, selecting it right now. So this is this little PFX. And that PFX will be the one that we're going to use in order to decrypt this data. Now, if you are wondering um, about the whole situation, what, what kind of stuff we've got over here, I will open the DER, so just the public key certificate. It kind of opens fast, so it will have no problem, to show you how dodgy this thing is. Yes? So it is a key indeed, and certificate on the top of it, which is issued by no one to no one, as you see. It's already not, it's not trusted. It's already expired. But who cares? I mean, mathematically, it's correct. OK? So we're going to use this guy. So I need approximately 
two, three minutes to finish up, let's have a look what we're going to do. That's going to be cool stuff. So I'm going to take the console of the regular user, because user has access to his own profile. And uh, I need to identify over here which of the master keys is the one that is used to encrypt my secret. And I have selected it for myself for the presentation purpose so that I don't have to go through all of them. So I've got this one. As I said, normally you've got less. You've got like three or four, so, or sometimes even one, so you don't have to really struggle too much. Uh, I've got this one. And uh, I will do, at that point, shift, right click, and I'm going to copy this guy um, to, 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 to not open with. No, 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 one more time. So no, 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 shift, right click. Yes, copy as path. That's what I want. Punk, perfect. Uh, so when we're going to get there, uh, then uh, we're going to get into our tools. So CQ tools and disk tools. And over here, I've got my little tool, which is called, uh, at the very beginning, we're going to do CQ hash calc in order to generate a hash of my password. Because what I'm going to do, guys, have a look and let's stay focused. I know it's in the afternoon, but this is the most important stuff right now, yes? So I'm taking this private key, decrypting my master key that encrypts the secrets. It stays in a decrypted form, which means I cannot use it because that's not how the data protection API works. So I have to encrypt it with the current hash of my password, yes? So that we've got the back-in-time situation. I don't know what's the previous user password, but I know how it works. That's why we're going to do this operation. So CQ hash calc. Um, let's do Mimikat, which is our password right now, and the username gives me this, gives me this. So I'm going to do like this, CQ master key AD, that's the tool that I'm, I will be using to perform the whole trick, and I will specify two things. First of all, I will do PFX, and I copied this PFX already to speed it up a little bit, so in this case, PFX will be the one that comes from the main controller, right? Now I'm going to specify a file, which is our master key to, that we're going to be working on, and then new hash, and this is the place where we will get this guy in. So we are decrypting with the PFX, encrypting with our new password, yes? Or new hash, uh, effectively. Lovely. Perfect. So we've got a new master key created, this one is called AD Modify. So the only thing I need to do, and this is the last stage, I rename it this one to Alt. Awesome. Here we go. And this AD Modified, I will change its name. Yes. So this is this AD Modified stuff. I will change its name so that basically um, it is exactly how it should be. But the problem with it, this is the case is that it's not system and it's not hidden by judging the icon. You see, it's a different icon. So the last thing, last, 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 I have to give it an attribute of system and hidden. And I'm going to do this. We have built a tool that already generates a command to do it. Punk. And then I'm changing these attributes. Enter. And now question of the universe is, will I be able to get access to the password of the user if I refresh it, as you see? Yes? OK, dazed and confused. What is the conclusion? Yes, Conclusion is quite straightforward that there is this little tiny private key within the domain controller's memory that you can use as a domain admin to decrypt people's, everybody's secrets, every, everything that people store in the browsers, every encryption, every protection for private key, anything that relies on a data protection API, including KeePass that I was showing on the previous session, you can get access to of every single human being within the company that is a member of the domain. So we could be thinking, well, but hacker needs to be a domain admin. I'm not thinking about the hacker here. Yes, I'm thinking more about the domain admin, actually. Yes? So do we trust our domain admin? That was my point. Because he can absolutely horribly impact the privacy of what we are doing within, within our um, company. So this is something that I would like to, I wanted to, to tell you. Summarizing, what are the attacks of the industry? 
I put on the top of that also spoofing, even though it's quite a simple attack, but this is because we don't have any kind of IPsec tunnels implemented, yes? But what else do we have? So we played with an offline access. I sneak through the Kerberos pre-out, which will be here anyway, because it's a quite serious thing. SMB relay, absolutely, because as long as we are using NTLM authentication and we don't have a code execution prevention implemented, that's problem ready, yes? Stuff like pasty hash, which can be mitigated by using labs, randomizing the local admin passwords, and also code execution prevention, and also credential guard implemented on the top of a Windows 10 only, unfortunately. Yes. So what is, what is the other stuff? Data protection API, backup keys, there's something we can do about it? Not much, because that's how it works. The only thing we can do is to implement a solution that will monitor a domain admin's behavior. Yes, there are plenty of solutions like this. And this is what I'm referring to. Domain admin, it's a kind of powerful, powerful person. And at the end, PowerShell-based attacks, so something where whenever we are executing the PowerShell, uh, and of course, we know that PowerShell can be executed both from the user and admin perspective. I showed you how to bypass execution policy, which was quite straightforward, but also why blocking the PowerShell is important, and that is because a lot of attacks right now are coming within the PowerShell. There is even, a, like I showed you, Metasploit, there is a PowerSploit. So it's a set of hacking tools written in PowerShell to avoid code execution prevention being misimplemented. Yes? So this is the setup we are dealing with. And at the very end, to challenge you a little bit and uh, put your brain in the afternoon on the good uh, vibes, uh, don't forget about the quiz. Yes? Thanks for telling me how many questions you had. I'm looking forward to uh, have a little bit better results, you know? So this is something <laughs> uh, to have a look at. It's uh, just a pure fun, uh, nothing more than that. And uh, if you are, um, th there's also a learning factor, by the way, because after every bad answer, I give you a comment that, uh, nope, you did wrong, sorry, yes? And uh, at the end, you're gonna see my dummy face if you're gonna have uh, not enough points. So uh, <laughs> uh, hopefully you're gonna do well. And if you want to follow, uh, we've got uh, different types of free uh, on the blog videos about how cool security is, everything that is now nice, new, and juicy, we post over there. There's a new blog post coming about Sysmon, and we are sharing different tools. If some of you ask me, what about the tools? Can I get the tools? Absolutely. Go through the blog post. You're going to get the tools because they are attached to every blog post. Yes, I like to use our own tools because they are kind of cool. So um, basically, uh, we always share them. Everything we talk about, we share. Yes, if there is something that is missing there, you want up front, it's not there, just drop us an email uh, and then we're going we're gonna, to uh, answer, yes, with the tool. So this is the setup. So thank you so much for my part. And now, wait, wait, Court is coming with the uh, cool stuff uh, to say. So for me, thank you. Thank you.